Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Gabriel. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the executive director of the National Women's Hall of Fame. I'm honored to welcome you to today's program with the esteemed Jean Kilborn. We ask all of our speakers to provide a visual description of themselves to aid any of our visually impaired audience members. So to start things off, I am a white woman with shoulder length brown hair. I'm in my mid forties and I wear glasses. I'm sitting in my home office, which has yellow walls uh, and there are pictures of sunflowers behind me. Since this program is virtual and we have folks joining us from all over the world, I wanna share with you a video showcasing the National Women's Hall of Fame and our beautiful home at the historic Seneca Knitting Mill in Seneca Falls, New York. Thank you for joining us this evening for what I know will be an incredibly inspirational event. We're so glad you're here and we hope we'll see you again in the future. Welcome to the 1844 Seneca Knitting Mill, home of the National Women's Hall of Fame. We are the first and oldest nonprofit organization dedicated to celebrating the achievements of great American women. We currently have 293 inductees whose stories inspire us and must be told so that all people of all genders across the nation understand their contributions to our society and our nation. In September of 2022, we will induct another class of nine incredible women whose contributions and stories will stand the test of time. And we are launching programming that seeks to inspire people across our nation and around our world. Our home is in the historic 1844 Seneca Knitting Mill, which has stood as a beacon of hope and inspiration to generations of people. There's something magical about standing in our building and looking out to the banks of the Cuga Seneca Canal and really understanding on a deep level how important that waterway is to our entire nation. The canal was a driver for so many important conversations and Seneca Falls was a major hub for the flow of information and for the exchange of ideas that allowed for important movements to begin from abolitionism to the women's rights movement. Our mission and the work we do is further enhanced because of our ability to call this historic building home. The Seneca Knitting Mill is one of the few surviving mills in this area, and its history is deeply intertwined with the mission of the National Women's Hall of Fame. For 155 years, the Seneca Knitting Mill produced woolen goods. Owners and management did not want to support slavery, and they made the decision to not use cotton for any of their products, and instead sourced wool from local sheep farmers. This was also one of the only businesses that employed women and immigrants, so it was a place for advancement, empowerment, and achievement. In fact, two of this building's original trustees attended the first Women's Rights Convention. We consider it a privilege to steward such a historic treasure. In the months and years to come, and with the generosity of donors, we will continue our work to renovate this building, expanding our exhibits and gathering spaces into the second, third, and fourth floors. Our museum and gallery space will be a pilgrimage site for people across the world to visit and feel energy, excitement, and inspiration from the stories we tell about the incredible achievements of our inductees. Storytelling is how history comes alive. I think about the little girl in Wyoming, the little boy in Maine, the professional who wants to change careers at 55, the new father who is raising triplet girls, the teen who is struggling to tell their parents they are transgender, the grandmother who wants to leave this world a better place for her family. The National Women's Hall of Fame has a place in inspiring all of these people and inspiring you. This is a great time to get involved. Join us. So as we position ourselves to host induction weekend in September, we are creating programming that focuses on themes that tie to the work and priorities of our inductees. This Women's History Month, the Hall decided to experiment with a new program we're calling Week of Women. The catch, our Week of Women, is happening right now during the first week of April. Through a series of panels, workshops, events, and curated social media campaigns, we have been exploring a wide range of topics relevant to our work to highlight the accomplishments of great American women. And by hosting the program in April, we reinforce that celebrating women's history is, and should be, a year-round activity. 
Today, we will be joined by the incredible Jean Kilborn. Jean is internationally recognized for her groundbreaking work on the image of women in advertising and for her critical studies of alcohol and tobacco advertising. Her films, lectures, and television appearances have been seen by millions of people throughout the world. The New York Times Magazine named Jean one of the top three most popular speakers on college campuses. She's the creator of the renowned film series, Killing Us Softly, Advertising's Image of Women. She has authored award-winning books, including Can't Buy My Love, How Advertising Changes the Way We Think and Feel, and So Sexy So Soon, The New Sexualized Childhood, and What Parents Can Do to Protect Their Kids, with Diane E. Levin. Jean was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 2015 and serves as a cherished member of our board of directors. Tonight, we are so lucky, lucky to be able to host a screening of Killing Us Softly 4, free of charge. The film is approximately 45 minutes long. After the film, around 8 p.m., I will be back with Jean for a live question and answer session. You can submit your questions using the comment box on the right-hand side of your screen at any time during the program. We encourage audience participation in the comments section, so let us know where you're coming from, what you're thinking, and all the questions that you have for Jean. Today's event is also equipped with closed captioning. You have the power to turn these captions on or off using the closed caption button on the bottom of the video screen. If you experience any technical issues, we recommend completely closing the page and then rejoining with the same link. We are using technology that is pretty new to us, so we apologize in advance for any errors that may occur. Because of copyright protections, we will not be recording the film for viewing later. However, you can find copies of Jean's film in libraries across the country and for rent and purchase online. All registrants will receive an email with a link to the recording of the Q&A of tonight's event, where you can watch it again yourself or share it with friends. This email will also include a brief survey. Please take a few minutes to complete it. Your feedback is immensely helpful to us as we continue to grow and improve our virtual programming. If you are unsure if you registered and would like a copy of the recording, please email us at admin at womenofthehall.org and we will add you to our mailing list. As you know, tonight's event is free for all. These virtual events are critical to our mission of showcasing great women, inspiring all. This includes making hall events accessible for all learners, including those with limited physical abilities or a lack of financial means. I hope you'll consider making a donation to the National Women's Hall of Fame as a not-for-profit. You can visit womenofthehall.org slash donate or click on the link in the event description to show your support. Every dollar helps. If you enjoyed today's program and want to learn more, consider, find, consider signing up for our e-newsletter and follow us on social media at Women of the Hall so that you can be the first to know about upcoming events and opportunities to get involved. It is now my pleasure to introduce Killing Us Softly 4. Extreme pleasure to introduce you to the amazing and pioneering activist, Jean Kilborn. Jean, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you know what? We're having a little bit of an audio, uh, audio problem. Um, Natalie, would you mind unmuting Jean? Better. Oh, there you go. There you go. Sorry about so, that. I thought that was going to be done for me. I don't know why, but anyway, yeah, sorry about that. I just wanted to thank you, say thank you, and that, and thanks also for the great job you're doing with the hall. It's really important. That's yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Jean. Yeah. Well, and and I'm curious. We we've got definitely some um, questions that are popping into the chat, but I have a couple that came in as you were speaking as well. And mm -hmm. one of the questions that we got was around the evolution of Killing Us Softly over time. The first film, from what I understand, came out in 1979. And this one that mm -hmm. we just watched was released in 2010. What inspired you to remake the film several times over? 
Well, I, I pretty much had to because the thing about advertising is it changes. The actual ads change all the time and they change very quickly. So even though the themes I've been talking about remain very much the same, uh, if I didn't use more up-to-date examples, it was easier for people to say, oh, well, that's not really true anymore or you know, that just isn't the case. So actually in all four versions of the film, I'm, I'm saying a lot of the same things, but I'm just using updated examples. And I can see now that this film is, you know, already what, 12 years old, the themes are still there. You know, I mean, everything I'm saying in this film is still happening, although in many ways it's gotten worse. And of course, there's the whole social media thing that has happened, you know, in that amount of time that, ha that isn't dealt with in this film. But I just needed to, well, in some ways my analysis changed, but also I needed to find um, better you know, more up-to-date examples, not better examples, but more up-to-date examples. I also, the first film was an incredibly cheaply made film. It, it cost $6,000 to make it. It was a one take, one camera film. Uh, actually, all the films are one take, but this was, the first one was one camera. And, uh, you know, and it went, in today's language, it went viral, uh, you know, without any marketing or anything like that. Uh, but I certainly wanted in subsequent films to have have them be technologically much better made. So I know you've talked in some interviews around how you got involved in this work to begin with, and it was really your own fascination with seeing images as you were flipping through magazines and tearing them out. Can you talk a little bit about that process then and sort of what that process is now for you, what you continue to do to sort of... I, sometimes, to sometimes I feel that like everything in my life kind of led me to this. I didn't intend to make a career out of it, but I I went to Wellesley College and then had to go to secretarial school to get a job because <laughs> that was, you know, a long time ago and that was the way it was for women. So I had a lot of mindless jobs and one of them was putting ads into uh, a British medical journal, the, the Lancet. And one of the ads was just unbelievably sexist and demeaning to women. And I remember looking at it, this was in 1968 and thinking, this is dreadful and it's not trivial and so I took it home and as I said in the film I put it on my refrigerator and I began to collect others now in those days no one was paying attention to ever the image of women in advertising I mean nobody it was not on anybody's radar but I was interested in it for several reasons for one I'd I'd done some work in media mostly as a secretary but nonetheless um, I'd worked for the BBC in London and for um, some other media outlets. And I'd also done some modeling. I mean, one of the few ways that one could make a lot of money as a woman in those days was to model. And I, and you were supposed to be simply grateful for the opportunity, you know? So um, I did do some modeling and that left me, it was very, it was soul destroying really. And there was a huge amount of um, uh, sexual harassment that came with the territory. And But it left me with a lifelong interest in the whole idea of the image, the power of the image and the fact that Ultimately, there are no winners. There's no more insecure group of women in the world than supermodels. Because if, you're, if your value is dependent on how you look, then, I mean, every day you're, you're losing your value, right? So anyway, that, that was part of what led me uh, into this. And I was also involved in the women's, the second wave of the women's movement. So all of those things led me to this. But as I said, I didn't intend to make a career out of it, but I started collecting the ads and then one thing led to another. Um, and I began to give the presentation and put to put the as into slides and gave presentations and found that it was a very effective way to teach people about about sexism and about um, all kinds of things, you know, related to women's issues. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find that you still today when you flip through magazines, tear things out and and can Continue. Yeah, to I, of course, hardly anybody flips through magazines anymore these days. But when I'm in office, yeah, but when, I, when I'm online, or you know, I, I, and I always, I still have this kind of strange double reaction. If I see an ad that's really terrible, my first reaction, I have to say, is probably something like, "Whoa, this will really fit well into my collection." You know, I got to use this in the next film, or maybe that's my second reaction. And the first one is, "This is dreadful." But in any event, I have both those reactions. But yeah, I do. I'm certainly aware of it and conscious of it. And of course, people send me stuff all the time, too. So I get I get more things that way. So we have a question that came in from an audience member named Kate. Jean, what are the biggest changes you've seen since 2010 or over the past decade in advertising? Mm -hmm. 
Um, hi, Kate. Thanks for being here. And uh, I think there, well, there are several. I mean, one is probably the biggest change is that uh, there's just so much more advertising than ever before. And that's particularly because of social media, you know, and the internet. And also because of that, because of social media, the advertisers are able to target us much, much more narrowly than they ever could before. You know, they can really, well, you know this, you look, you look for something online and then for the next month, you get ads for it, you know, popping up no matter where you are. So there, and there, and Facebook and, you know, Instagram, all of these things are, are just, they're advertising um, vehicles, basically. That's what they are. You know, they, and what they're doing is they're selling us to advertisers and they're mining us for data, which we willingly give. Um, and then advertisers use it to sell us stuff. And that's huge. And that's a huge change from how it was even in 2010. So that's one change. Uh, another change and is that there is, and I mentioned this in the film, is that I'm, I'm just not alone anymore at all. I was completely alone in the late 60s, had to convince everybody, including other feminists, that this was an issue. And now, I mean, I think a lot of what I said that was radical then is mainstream now, and people are much more aware of it. And there's also been a lot of research that backs up, you know, what I, what I said, you know, 50 years ago. <laughs> Well, and you you really uh, created your own field in terms of media literacy and making sure that the these messages got into um, classrooms and into communities mm -hmm. to have robust conversations. Can you talk a little bit about how you made that happen? What was sort of the launch of the, sort of that media literacy aspect of what you have accomplished? All of this, it's funny because all of this was not very deliberate. I mean, I didn't sort of plot a course and then follow it. It was a uh, it was not a bright straight highway. It was a lot of alleys and detours and everything else. But um, first of all, I just became, I was involved in the women's movement. I became um, like many people sort of incredibly aware of um, uh, things that I'd been totally sort of unaware of before. And I wanted to spread the word and to get other, other people sort of to educate other people about it. Um, and as I began to look at the ads and put together the slideshow, I thought, well, what's going to, what will help here? I knew it wasn't going to be trying to get the advertisers to change. I mean, that's just not going to happen. I mean, they will change only if we demand change, you know, if, as we, if we demand change, they will change. But um, it, it seemed to me that media literacy, teaching people um, how the media operate, and this means much more than just being able to deconstruct ads, although that's part of it, but also understanding that the news is not the news. The news is what, you know, a small group of people think will bring in the most people to be there for the advertisers. So anyway, that all of that led me to think about, well, all right, so media literacy would be really important. So in many ways, I became an advocate for media literacy. Um, and still am. In the 70s, I also started looking at alcohol and tobacco advertising and made films and wrote books and things about those topics. And that's when I began to see that these were public health problems. You know, I, I didn't really see it that way before. My doctorate's in education. It's not in public health, although it could have been. Um, I also began to get colleagues. Um, this all happened in like the 80s. I was sort of working alone until then. And I had colleagues, I mean, of course, feminists who were working on these issues, but also people in the field of um, alcohol and tobacco, you know, prevention. And so it seemed that um, media literacy could be a tool that could help. Well, let's put it this way. I started smoking when I was 13. There was no, you know, warning labels, nothing then. Um, and if people had shown me photos of diseased lungs, you know, then and when I was 13 and said, you know, look what could happen to you, you could die by the time you're 50, I would have said, who cares? Who wants to live to be that old? <laughs> really? Um, but if somebody had said to me, you're spending your money being manipulated by a very powerful industry, that would have gotten my attention. So that's what I decided to do was to sort of get the word out that these very powerful industries were manipulating us um, and encouraging addiction, among other things, because the addict is the ideal consumer. And uh, and so I did. I, I was the first person, I think, to use media literacy as a as a tool uh, for public health, basically. And that's so. It was all those things that led to that. Yeah, it's incredible. What a great career path, especially since you didn't <laughs> plot it out from the beginning. It's, it's not at all. Oh, let me also tell you, Jen, because I always like to say that I think everybody, I, I like women in particular to hear this, is that I had a terror of public speaking when I began, and. 
I, I had so I was actually always pretty good at it. That had nothing to do with it. I was just terrified. Um, and I mean, I was nervous enough that in the beginning I had to stand behind a podium so that my, my shaking legs wouldn't be seen. I learned a trick of putting Vaseline on my teeth so my lips wouldn't stick to my teeth, you know, because your mouth gets so dry. Uh, the first time I, I went to give a big lecture, I seriously considered driving off the road, not to kill myself, but just to be incapacitated. Anyway, it was... And, and I say that because I think that a lot of women have this fear. Um, some men do too, for that matter. But, um, and that it's incredibly important to uh, find our voices and to use them. And what I did, I had something I really wanted to say. I just did it and I kept doing it. And then eventually it became you know, easier and easier. But we all have something important to say. Oh, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Shelley. Any thoughts on the fact that men and boys are now having increased rates of body dysmorphia? Yeah, well, I'm not surprised. I mean, it, that is true. And um, yeah, and it is sad, you know, that it would be nice if women's rates were going down rather than men going up. But again, um, advertisers profit when we're feeling terrible about ourselves. I mean, we don't buy a whole lot of useless stuff if we're feeling fine, you know. Um, so the, the way that they can... Uh, increase the market is to get men to be concerned about these issues too. Um, and for men, of course, it's much more about being big and being powerful and, um, you know, having the six packs and abs and that sort of thing. So they just, they've been doing much more of that. And, and not surprisingly, in the same way that the extraordinarily thin models uh, came along and we saw an incredible rise in eating disorders among uh, women, uh, we're seeing this rise in body dysmorphia by men. And I'm not saying that advertising is totally res totally responsible, solely responsible for this, but it certainly plays a very big role. A uh, question from uh, Jennifer. This is a kind of interesting one. Social media has changed the world of advertising and the channels used to reach women and girls. Given that fact, is there anything particularly different that you'd say if you did a Killing Us Softly Five? Yeah, well, I'd have to I'd have to use a whole lot of social media and uh, oh hi Jennifer <laughs> and uh, anyway um, so this this particular Jennifer let me give a little plug here is the founder of this incredible organization called About Face and it's on my resource list on my website and everybody should go there uh, with a gallery of of ads and you know positive and negative and a whole lot of action and everything else so it's a wonderful organization that's been around for quite a while and Jennifer does wonderful work. So uh, yeah, I'd have to say everything differently. And this is one of the reasons why I'm not going to do a Killing Us Softly Five. Um, it's just the whole idea of how to incorporate social media and how to get at all of that is just a little bit beyond me right now. Maybe so, somebody, else, somebody else should pick up the mantle and do that. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, so a very interesting kind of segue into a question from Keith. Um, Jean, can you please mention some other works that might educate people of all genders on these topics? So you just mentioned your research page. Are there some other? Um, oh, other on the website, there's, a, there's an extensive um, resource list, um, and it, I've just updated it. And so, and the updated version isn't quite on there yet, but it will be very soon. Uh, and there's a ton of resources now, which is another very nice thing that's changed. Um, I, I go to the website for the Media Education Foundation, which is the company that distributes and makes my films, and they have an incredible number of extraordinary films. They have the films of, of Jackson Katz, who's done work on images of men and, and how men can uh, help stop violence against women. He's been doing that work for decades. He's written about it. He has several films. Jackson and I did a film together a while ago called Spin the Bottle, Sex, Lies, and Alcohol, which is about drinking on college campuses and how different it is depending on gender. So that's, uh, the, and media, MEF has many, many, many other films. I mean, they have films by Bell Hooks. They have films by um, just all, all, sorts of, all sorts of people. So I would go there. Um, and oh, there's just so much stuff now that's just really um, wonderful. So I, I think, I'd, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks, check my website and there's this resource list, which really is uh, updated. That's great. And for everyone who's watching right now, we will also send out that link um, to everyone who registered. So if you'd like to make sure that you receive that, please make sure you email us at admin at womenofthehall.org. Great. Um, Kathy has a question for you. 
uh, does the revulsion that some feel about hypersexualization and violence against women in ads create backlash? For example, a rising number of people who identify as asexual. Wow. Yeah, I, almost never, I, I almost never get a question I haven't been asked before. <laughs> um, but this is one. So hi, Kathy, and congratulations. Uh, wow. I mean, I haven't... That's really, that's an interesting idea. I've really never thought about it, so I don't feel like I can really answer it, but I will think about it. I mean, there, you're right that there are rising numbers of people who have, are just tuning out and identifying as asexual. And maybe that is this constant pressure and this constant, as you say, hypersexualization and the violence and all of that may well play a part in that. I'll have to, I'll have to think about it. I'll get back to you. Very nice. Oh. Good job, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, another question from Kate. What is your response to present day capitalization of social movements by companies? For example, the commercialization of Black Lives Matter, Pride Month, you know, those sorts of movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a whole whole new category of, of what I call fovertizing or, you know, advertising that co-ops movements for social change. And advertising has always done that. I mean, starting with um, the second wave of uh, women, uh, the women's movement uh, with Virginia Slims, you've come a long way, baby. I mean, the, the incredible fact that they would link, you know, uh, liberation for women with addiction is extraordinary, but they got away with it. Uh, we see it with certainly with Black Lives Matter. We see it with pride. We see it with the green movement, companies that claim to be so green, but they're not really. Now, there are some companies that I think are seriously dealing with some of these issues. Not that many of them, but some, but there are a whole lot more that are just co-opting uh, these movements. And I have a friend and a, a colleague named Katie Martell, M-A-R-T-E-L-L. -L. You can Google her. And she has a wonderful presentation on this very issue of the co-optation of these movements by, uh, by advertising. And that was also the topic, by the way, of my doctoral dissertation was how uh, how advertisers were co-opting the, the women's movement, the language and the goals of the women's movement to sell us products. Oh, wow, fascinating. Yeah. So we have a question from um, Rach. Uh, the past few years have seen more uh, equity in advertising, men in diaper or laundry detergent commercials, women being seen in ads as things traditionally thought of as male, like cops or scientists. Jean's work was the predictor for a cultural flashpoint. Are there things of note that you have witnessed as progress? Are there things you've noted that are actually regressive in the last 12 years? Yeah. Well, certainly, I mean, what you point out, and hello, and thanks for being here, um, you do see much more of that. I mean, you see, you see something you never saw, you know, 40 years ago, men doing laundry or anything like that. I mean, for a period of time in the 80s, uh, we had the superwoman and she was the the woman who you know was she would say like you know i'm a brain surgeon but right now i'm making muffins for my family and it was sort of the idea that you were supposed to be able to do all of this but you still didn't see men with children and now we're seeing much more of that and that is definitely a good thing um so I, that is a something that has changed for the for the better and more women in in positions of power and all of that um i i also think it's important you know to um to applaud this, but to also look at what's going on in the companies that are creating these ads. Are, are, is there equity in these companies? You know, are there women on their boards? Are there women are, you know, are in positions of power? Do they give paternity leave? Do they encourage men to take it? So it's not simply that do they have, you know, better ads and, and that's a good thing, but are they walking the walk as well? You know, so uh, I think that that's, that's important to ask. Um, and in terms of what's become more regressive, I guess the uh, I, there's so much that the I mean the emphasis on on beauty and um, certain body type and all of that I don't see that as getting any better at all. In fact, in many ways it's worse because uh, girls in particular and young women are so encouraged to post photoshopped images of themselves and then compare themselves with um, the idealized images of their peers. You know, it's not just comparing themselves with supermodels anymore. And so that's um, that's hard. I think that makes it much more difficult. And, and the hypersexualization, it's so it's so hard to talk about this because it, you, it can seem make you seem like you're prudish or something. But the truth is, it's really, 
it's such a cliched approach to what sex is, as I say in the film. I mean, it's just such a stereotypical, um, shallow uh, way of portraying uh, sexuality and what's sexy. Um, so there's there's all that. <laughs> so and we're still very much up against that. Um, well, this one, this next question really taps into your media uh, literacy and education uh, side of your brain. We've been battered with propaganda and often unfounded claims of false news, causing many of us to distrust the media rather than encouraging critical assessments. Mm -hmm. How do we counter that issue? Well, actually, media literacy would help a lot because um, in, in a in you know, and, and most other countries, we're the only developed nation in the world that doesn't teach media literacy in its schools. So, um, and we arguably need it more than any other country. Um, so that a, a media, a media literate public would be able to uh, discern what's, what's real and what isn't. And where are the sources? I mean, would look at the sources and would not be so easily taken in and manipulated by the fake news that we're surrounded by. Uh, and would demand better too. I mean, would would support investigative journalism and uh, you know all sorts of things that uh, we're in in terrible trouble now because we don't have this, uh, and people are so easily um, taken in and manipulated and misled. So I think media literacy uh, teaching again, and that that means teaching people how to understand the media and not just how to deconstruct it, but how to see. Um, as I said earlier, I mean, uh, uh, what's, what is the news? Why do we not get background on the news? What about if it bleeds, it leads? I mean, we hear about horrible crimes that happen in some place that, you know, in the country that is, is not us and it, you, or not a local to us. And yet then we become hysterically fixated on that, you know? So rather than looking at the kind of much more systemic uh, problems that are are, effect, are affecting all of us. So, uh, anyway, we need we need much more of that, and much. And if we taught media literacy, and it should start in kindergarten, and you know, in an age appropriate way, and uh, then I think we'd be much less susceptible to all of this. And do you have any ideas for people who might be in their adult years who don't have access to educational resources? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that can where places that they could go to begin to educate themselves. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. And again, I'll refer you to my non-existent resource list, but it will be there soon. <laughs> uh, but there is a whole section on uh, where you can go to, and and actually, a lot of the films at MEF are, you know, uh, are they're about they're all about media literacy, really. And some they, they can be expensive, so but if that's a problem, then you can, um, you know, they're in many libraries, particularly university libraries, but also many other libraries as well. And the, I think that can be a wonderful way to educate yourself, watch a whole bunch of films about uh, various aspects of uh, these problems. The MEF has a lot of films about racism and about uh, propaganda and all sorts of things. Great, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thinking about social media for a second, while there are certainly a number of challenges with social media, uh, and we've talked about some of them tonight, how can we actually use social media as a positive way to change the narrative in advertising? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sure there are ways that we could, but but the, the big problem with social media is what I talked about earlier, which is that its its purpose is to deliver us to advertisers, you know, and uh, so it's it's always going to be about that. That's going to be its main thrust is to get lots and lots of people who can be sold to advertisers and and who will give up our data so that advertisers can use it to sell us things. So and it's not unlike if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, what what gets the most clicks is often what's most sensational or untrue. Um, so fighting that, you know, is is not easy. And using social media to do it, I'm sort of reminded of Audre Lorde's wonderful quote that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. You know, and but on the other hand, these are the only tools we have. So maybe we'll have to find ways to use them to dismantle the master's house. But it's um, it it's not it's not easy because you know, it, and and maybe some of it would have to do with coming up with different forms of social media, which I know people attempt to do, but then it gets swallowed up, you know, by uh, by the kind of monopoly that you know Facebook and these other some of these other platforms have, right. 
Um, we'll probably have a time for maybe one or two more questions. I have one um, that I actually wrote down as as you were talking. Um, we got a comment that made me laugh out loud in the in the comment section of this, um, and it was around the Oreo um, advertising <laughs> advertisement mm -hmm. show. And the, the comment was as if I wouldn't eat a dirty uh, Oreo that's been sitting on the floor, or as as though I wouldn't eat an ugly Oreo that was on the floor. Um, <laughs> And mm -hmm. I, I thought that was, you know, obviously tongue in cheek, but also mm -hmm. what when we do see these ads as consumers and there is something that is um, here, what what do we do? What are the right tactics? What's the most effective approach for addressing this? Well, I mean, one thing I'll refer you back to about FACE, the organization I just mentioned, and, you know, Jennifer's here, um, I mean, the other Jennifer, <laughs> and um, because they do have a lot of action items and things like that, and things ways you can get involved in trying to bring about change with these images. And another wonderful organization is the Representation Project, and that's also on my list. So it's Representation Project, Google that. And that began with the film called Misrepresentation, which was made maybe maybe 12 years ago about um, the ways in which these images of women um, disempower us politically, you know, make it less likely that women will run for political office, make us feel more ho hopeless, you know, about being able to take action for, for change. And Misrepresentation is a wonderful film. And, um, everybody in the world is interviewed in it, including me, but it, it's really, really um, t terrific. And some other inductees are actually, I just realized that Dolores Huerta and Jane Fonda and you know, lots of other inductees are in that film. Um, so uh, I would, you know, I think that that's, you know, one, that's another place to look. So there, they, it, it, I used to suggest when I started out that people write letters to advertisers. How quaint is that? Um, but you said, obviously, nobody writes letters anymore, and you don't need to do that. And it's so much easier now because you can just go online and, you know, fire off a, a comment or something. But even better, join with some of these other groups that are, you know, doing this in a um, more concerted or more organized kind of way. Oh, there's another wonderful organization called Fair Play, which is about uh, advertising aimed at children. And it gives you lots of ideas about how to fight back against that. Amazing. So you brought up the inductees. So my last question is going to need to be about the National Women's Hall of Fame, of course. We love that you are part of the 2015 class um, mm -hmm. and part of the 302 amazing women that we have honored over the course of our 50-some years in existence. You're a board member as well. And I'm curious, What's your what, what's your vision for the National Women's Hall of Fame? How can we continue to spread the message and really get more people to understand the power of women's stories? Yeah. Well, I think first of all, I think it's incredibly important, and I and it's wonderful that we're at a real turning point, you know, with the hall now, which is uh, really trying to make it national. You know, it, it's been uh, for for lots of reasons, it's, it's tended to be sort of more local, and now we're in this gorgeous new space. Um, we have you as you know heading us up, and that's wonderful. Um, and it, there's just a real um, push. A whole lot more people are getting interested in donating and becoming involved um, because I think people do understand, as you said, Jen, that our stories are incredibly powerful, and it's really important to get them out there. History, traditionally, the study of history has not told women's stories, and um, so. Uh, this is a place, the hall is a place where the stories get told, where women get celebrated, and where we find ways to continue to inspire people. And, and certainly not just women, but, you know, as you said in the, the opening video, you know, a little boy, you know, or, you know, there are people, men and women, all all, all people uh, can be inspired by these stories. And, uh, and we need to, and the wonderful thing the hall is doing is uh, t getting these stories out there and also finding ways to, uh, show how um, th they can be inspire people and bring about real change. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, so much for your time this evening, for joining us, for sharing your talents and, and, uh, and all the information with us. We really have enjoyed this evening um, and, and can't wait to see this resource list and to send it out and, yeah. and hopefully to keep making some good strides in improving the image of women um, in the media. It was my pleasure to be here and thanks to everybody who was showed up and for all your wonderful questions. And again, thanks, uh, Jen, for all your, your exciting leadership. Thank you. Yeah. 
So as we wrap up this evening, I do want to express my appreciation once again to Jean um, and to thank all of you for joining us as well. The books and the resources that were mentioned today will be included in a follow-up email as well as um, in additional posts that we'll make on our sure if you registered for the event, you could again can email admin at womenofthehall.org and we will include you on our email list. This project was made possible in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the Museum Association of New York, as well as the support of our many 2021 and 2022 sponsors. Finally, remember that even though Women's History Month is over, we can learn about women year round. Here at the National Women's Hall of Fame, we aim to share incredible stories like Jean's every day. If you're curious about what's happening behind the scenes here at the National Women's Hall of Fame, or just wanna learn more about us, please join us tomorrow for After Hours with the Executive Director. I'll be back to close out our week of women and to host a public question and answer session at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Please join me if you can. And thank you for joining us tonight and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you.